In the world of concealed handguns, it seems that every company is trying to compete with the Glock 19 and the Glock 17. And what you'll see is that companies are always trying to get on par with Glock or surpass Glock in various ways. And consumers are always looking for the mythical Glock killer. And because of this desire to recreate the Glock and the success of the Glock pistols, you're seeing manufacturers now that are quite literally copying the DNA of the Glock 17 and Glock 19 pistols and injecting their own flavor of different accessories and modifications to the pistols to try to make an already epic pistol even more epic. And the question is, will any company ever truly create a Glock killer? And I don't know the answer to that question, but I do have one of the options on the market, and this is coming to you by popular demand of our followers. So today, I'm going to take a stab at the PSA Dagger. Uh, just a heads up, Brenton, this was the point where you're supposed to dip and go into that cool oh, B-roll. Oh, okay, I got you. Like right now, no, no, do I it. I got you, I got you. Tools you use on the range can either help or hurt you. You gotta invest in quality gear to get a quality return on that investment. So what you're gonna see me using today in this PSA Dagger video are a couple different target systems that we manufacture right here in Southeastern Pennsylvania. So we're gonna be using our mini ADAP, like the system that I have on the left here with the new Gen 5 top brackets, the new breakdown bases. These are the half inch AR550 systems. This is by far the most popular system that we sell in our lineup. You'll also see me incorporating our Gen 2 auto reset poppers onto the range day. And I'm gonna be using them in the knockdown setting today to be able to track my performance and impacts on those steel targets. And then further, we're gonna mix in some cardboard because our USPSA targets really give you the ability to hone in and track your metrics of your performance. It's critical that you're doing that, especially as you are learning a new pistol like I'm doing today. So I've got another special bit of information for you guys. Because you're here, you're subscribed to our channel, you already probably hit that like button. If you didn't, you should be doing that. I have a gift for you and it's a code that you can use. This is special for all of you watching this particular video. Use Dagger15, so Dagger15 at checkout at tatargets.com. We're gonna put that down in the description. It will save you 15% off of your first or next target order on our website. But just keep in mind, I'm only gonna keep this code open for a couple weeks. So check the timestamp on this video. If it's a couple weeks from now that you're watching this, please get on the website, take advantage of that. It is available to you for a short time. It's enough of that stuff, let's get into the video. So I'll be honest, when we got a lot of requests for the dagger, I was sort of not very excited. I kind of put in jest in one of our recent videos that I titled, The One Pistol Everyone Should Own. I kind of made the joke that if a lot of people request us to do a video on the dagger, that I would do it because immediately when I found out the PSA released the dagger, I just kind of thought to myself, okay, it's just another Glock clone. And it's not that I'm bored of Glock clones, it's that they're all based on Glocks. So at the end of the day, they're trying to become a Glock or be as close to Glock-like as possible. And what you end up finding with pistols like this is they end up tweaking certain things. And by they, I mean the companies, they tweak certain things that they think will help their particular pistol sell better than maybe a Glock or maybe appeal to M&P people or SIG people. So they're trying to make some compromises while still utilizing some of the DNA of a Glock pistol. And almost all of the Glock clones are based off of Gen 3 Glocks. I'm pretty sure that has to do with patents that are now expired. So a lot of the fit, finish, function, the feel of things, and even the part interchangeability is often going to be interchangeable with the Gen 3s. And I don't know about the PSA dagger here. I don't know if you can slap Gen 3 parts in it or not. I didn't do any research into that. So for this video, I'm just gonna be running it in its stock fit, form, and, and function. But at the beginning here, the first thing that I just wanted to overview is what I think of this thing right out of the box. And a quick disclaimer that I think is important anytime that we're doing videos like this, PSA did not send this pistol to me. I didn't contact them about it other than I sent them my personal FFL for the company. 
but I paid full retail price for this pistol. There were no discounts. This isn't given. I didn't promise a video to PSA. There's no contracts, nothing. I don't even know anybody over at PSA. So this is a 100% unbiased take on this pistol. If I hate this pistol by the end of the range day, I'm gonna throw it in the weeds, drive away in my Mercedes Benz. And uh, rip off into the distance and tell you that I don't like it because I don't have any kind of buy-in to this pistol. But right away, you're gonna see how I have this set up. Now, the model that I purchased here, this is like a, a Glock 19 size. It says full size S, so it has serrations on it. It's got some ports on the slide here. I don't have a ported barrel or anything. Um, it's got a nice finish. I don't know if that's like a DLC finish or some kind of nitride or, or whatever, but it's got a nice finish on it. It has taller sights because I did purchase the threaded barrel. And at the very, very end of this video, I'll shoot this thing suppressed and we'll see if it cycles like that. I put my Trigicon SRO on the top. And yes, for the trolls that are watching this video, I'm pretty sure that this red dot cost me more than this entire pistol did. Uh, but that's neither here or there. It doesn't really matter. I wanted a good optic on this thing. As far as the grip, this is where it kind of varies from a Glock 19. We have this palm swell, this little hump in here. And honestly, I will say just from a very beginning standpoint, that does feel nice in my hand. It seems to fit my hand well. It's got a little bit more of a beaver tail than a Glock 19 does. And I've got this big callus on my thumb because my Glocks tend to chew me up pretty good. The one thing that I'll say, and I only have enough time zeroing this, so I have very little opinion on this, but this little hump right here for my finger, I guess I have fat fingers, but this really pinches me already. So I can tell you, if I decide to keep this as like a personal gun, there's a couple things I'm gonna do. One of them right away, I'm gonna dremel that thing off. It's gonna be gone right away. As far as how this thing works, it's just like a Glock 19. It's got a mag release, very similar to a Gen 3 Glock, but it does stick out pretty far. There's pros and cons to that with any pistol. If it sticks out really far, it's easy to get to, but it can get in the way of some of your controls and things like that. Taking down this pistol is gonna be just the same as a Glock 19 and all of the other maintenance and things like that just the same as a Glock 19. The threaded barrel is a half by 28 thread pitch, so any of our suppressors or accessories like that are gonna work. I did put a TLR7A weapon light on this, and I am gonna be using it out of my sidecar holster, which we'll talk about at the end of the video. It does fit, but that's one thing right at the beginning of this video I wanna get out of the way. This pistol's a little bit different in size than a Glock 19, so you might have some holster fitment issues. The trigger is one thing you're gonna notice right away. It's a little different than a Glock trigger. It's got a little bit of a flat face. It does have the built-in safety, so you can't press it and accidentally set this thing off unless you actually rotate the little finger on the end there. One thing that I'm not sure if I'm gonna like or hate yet is they did a magwell very similar to the Masada. And if you watch our Masada video, that's like the only thing that I truly, truly hate about that particular pistol is the fact that they do this goofy crap with magazines and I don't understand it. And I have a sinking suspicion that when I get into reloads, I'm gonna fumble quite a bit because of this weird lip that's right here. And again, if I keep this thing as a personal use, I'm gonna take it to the bandsaw in the shop and I'm literally just gonna chop that thing right off. Um, and that's, again, me just guessing at this point. I don't remember what the retail price was, but I wanna say it was less than 400 bucks. So I understand why people are interested in it because you can get a very inexpensive Glock but the question that I'm gonna to try to answer on this range day is, <laughs> is it better to just buy a Glock? Like if we're talking about 400 bucks, again, I don't remember the price, say it's 400 bucks, Brenton can put up on the screen what I actually paid. Maybe you spend 589 and get a real Glock. I don't know yet whether I'm gonna like it or not, but the first thing that we're gonna do right here, right now, is I'm gonna learn the trigger because a lot of you are gonna be asking about that. So I'm gonna holster this guy up and get my ear pro on. And then I have a USPSA target at five yards. So the only objective here is I'm gonna to try to analyze the trigger press. I have no feeling in my finger. Never talked about is the fact that I have no feeling in my trigger finger. So you're probably crazy coming to me saying like, hey, how does the trigger feel? I'm gonna do my best to communicate to you guys based on my experience with pistols, how it stacks up. But that's the objective here. So we've got the magazine that was included, it's a Magpul PMAG 17, I think, that came with this pistol in the box or bag thing. And I'm just gonna put a couple rounds on target real quick. A 
Okay, so real quick. This is gonna be really hard for me to show you guys. This is not like a Glock right out of the box, I can tell you this. So this trigger is extremely mushy. I'm gonna put it that way. You know, Glocks get a lot of hate for their triggers, but we can see here that there's not really a wall. Like it kind of gives you this impression that there would be a wall, but when I get to the wall, I can push beyond it. And now watch how far it has to move before it actually clicks. And the reset, you can see that, like watch this again. Watch that reset. And there's that much mush from the reset. So let me put a couple more rounds. I just wanna get a little bit more familiar with this particular trigger. Okay, so just like I had suspected, reloads, I can tell you, and we're gonna get into them in depth in the rest of the video, but the reload right away, my magazine hung up on that goofy little lip there. So I'm gonna describe the trigger as not horrible, but I don't like it as much as my stock Glock 19. But obviously I ripped out some shooting there, some strings of fire, all accurate in the A zone at this distance. So I don't think that that's a hindrance, but that's a little bit of a rundown of the trigger at this point. Now that I've sort of established what the trigger's like and what I can expect from it, I wanna walk back 10 yards and I'm gonna be doing a couple variations of strings of fire because now at this point, what I'm most interested in is how that grip angle and how that trigger affects my ability to do strings of fire. I mean, pushing out, shooting one shot, yes, that will tell you a little bit about the gun, but when I was discussing earlier about a stock Glock chewing up my fingers, I never really notice it when I am simply shooting one shot, anything like that. It's when I start drawing and I have some imperfections in my presentation or, or whatever, I'm adjusting my grip, that's when I start getting chewed up. So I wanna see, does the dagger act any better than a Glock? So we're down here at 10 yards. I did use my range finder, by the way, for all you haters, this wasn't just stepped out. So 10 yards, first we're gonna start by pushing out, I'm gonna pull it out of the holster, not draw from the holster, just have it out, do three rounds at 10 yards. And the target, everything's in the A zone at, at this point, except for one hit was a Charlie, I marked that off downrange. So, all right, I'm gonna do this one on the beep. So three rounds. Okay, that was a 1.55, one Charlie, the rest are alphas. Let's do it again. Oh, that was interesting. So what just happened there is my finger kind of favored the top of the trigger and I wasn't even able to squeeze the trigger. It just, I kind of had my pressure biased toward the top. And again, like I said at the beginning, unless you have your finger perfectly down on that little tang, it's not gonna release the safety mechanism. So let's try that one more time on a beep. One Charlie, rest alpha is 1.29. Let's do a draw and we're gonna do six rounds here. Oop, I hit the beeper. So let's hold on a second. All right, from a draw, we're gonna do six rounds. That's interesting. That sounded an awful lot like a squib, which I'm not necessarily gonna blame the gun if there was a malfunction because it could be ammo related. So let's check that. Definitely something strange. So what we're gonna do is just shine a light up through here. I can see light, so we know we don't have a squib. 100% good that we don't have a squib. So let's give that drill one more shot. Guys, when you're shooting ammo, it doesn't really matter what brand, you can have malfunctions like that. So unless we start seeing that consistently with the pistol, I'm not gonna say that's the pistol. Okay, so a couple are up in the Charlie. It's not necessarily horrible. I definitely didn't have a great grip when I presented that. 
I've got enough. Let me do one more string of six rounds. Those are all, all alphas there. And that was a 2.79. So I can tell you guys right now, just kind of recapping what I'm feeling with the grip. I don't hate that palm swell. That grip angle to me, it's different than a Glock 19 or a Glock 17. I actually really like it. I'm not getting chewed up at all. So the slide is physically unable to touch my skin. That's a bonus. But already, you can see hopefully on camera, my finger right here is already getting rubbed raw. So I can tell you that after an entire range day, because of this little nub here, I would destroy my hand. And it's because my, what is that middle ring? Ring finger. My is it a ring finger if it's on your right hand? I don't even know. Ring finger here actually sits on the center of that little nub. It's kind of hard for me to show you, but it's pinching right there. So again, I said the solution for this, and I kind of figured this is what it would be like, would be to actually eliminate that little nub from there. It's super easy to do with a Dremel. But man, this thing just feels really nice at this point. It feels like a Glock, you know what I mean? Kind of feels like a Glock. Aside from that little trigger malfunction, it really does feel like that grip angle and my purchase on this really does allow for this gun just to cycle and do what it needs to do. So that's pretty good so far, I think. My next objective that I'm gonna focus in on is a little bit of reload drills, but the thing I'm gonna say is I don't put a whole lot of stock in just standing here and doing tons of reloads. I don't think that they are as important as we used to think back in 2017 and 2018 on Instagram. I already have done five or six reloads just on this range day alone, organically. As they come up in my training, I have to reload. But as I stated, because this thing has such a funky magwell, I already am stumbling with some of these reloads, so I do want to put a little bit of time into the reload. And the way that I'm gonna do that is I have two of our poppers downrange set up to fall over. So our Gen 2 poppers could be set to auto reset or they can be set to just fall over. I wanna do the fall over method because what I'm doing is a two reload two drill. First two rounds are on the reduced C zone popper. I'm gonna try to land two rounds on that target before it falls over and then reload transition to the C zone size popper, two rounds, knock it over. And then we're gonna go down range. I'll talk a little bit about that, but it's gonna help me understand the reload process of this particular pistol. One last little tidbit, when it comes to reloads, I really think you are better off if you just spend time working those reloads in dry fire. And then you go out to the range with real bullets and you proof of concept what you're learning in dry fire, so. All right, on the beep, we are going to do a two reload two. Not bad. That was a 4.11. The first shot was really slow. That's a 1.49. I should be able to draw and impact that target in probably closer to like a second, maybe 1.1. With my Glock 19, I'm definitely quicker. I'm still learning this thing. But let's go down range. I'm gonna reset these poppers. And the thing that I like about the poppers is the fact that you can utilize them in a knockdown fashion like this. And you can see right here, we've got impact, impact. But if I wanted to, and I didn't wanna to have to go down range and reset, we have springs in the back that you can set up and re-engage. And then you're gonna be able to keep them in the upright position and not ever have to walk down range. Now there's benefits to doing it the way that I'm doing it now. This is forcing me to analyze my hits. I have to pay attention to what I'm doing. If I hit really low, I might not get them to knock over. Maybe I have to send an extra round down range. So it really depends on what you're trying to do. But when uh, one of our guys, Leo and myself, created the Gen 2 Popper, we really wanted to create this dynamic system that allows you to integrate it into drills like this, to be able to really analyze what you're doing. So that reload wasn't horrible. We're gonna to try to pick up some speed here. I'm gonna do it one more time. On the beat.
Okay, a 4.27. First shot was a 1.38. So I shaved off about a tenth of a second, but again, I'm still learning this pistol. So what I just noticed right there is the fact that this is very doable, the reloads I should say. They don't feel as bad as I had expected with the magwell being shaped the way that it is. Ultimately, I just have to be able to line up that mag and shove it in there. It's still not as seamless as a pistol that has a very flared magwell. And I'm still like 60, 70% of me says I'm gonna take this to the bandsaw and I'm gonna hack that thing right off and then do a little bit of beveling. But aside from that, I'm not, no, I'm not too upset with that. I think that this thing is doing pretty good and it's, uh, it's growing on me. As I do these range days and I'm learning a new pistol, I start to slowly combine different aspects of shooting into drills that are a little bit more complicated. I've gotten some of the basics and fundamentals out of the way, so now we're gonna work some transitions with this pistol. So on the beep, we're gonna two rounds on the mini ADAP down there at like 10, 12 yards, two rounds into, actually three rounds, then three rounds into the USPSA target, then three rounds to the right. We're gonna be working those transitions. So on the beep. Okay, 4.58, had a miss on the one on the right. One thing you'll notice that as I'm shooting, if I'm doing my part correct, this is the same with every type of gun or weapon, I should be, after I engage that target, my eyes should look to the next target where I'm transitioning and then drive the gun to that. If you try to sweep in line with your eyes, you ultimately end up either overshooting or undershooting your target. And that's when you'll see rounds landing, like with the USPSA target, I'll have some in the Delta Charlies on either the left or right of the target. That's just one of the indicators. So now I'm gonna do the opposite. We're gonna start on the right side, transition to the left on the beep. It was obviously a little bit slow. I had a couple little malfunctions. They were pretty much user induced so now what we're going to do is i'm going to do two rounds into the uspsa target and then two rounds left two rounds right this is the last time i'm going to run this particular drill so i did a little bit of what i was explaining over on this right transition i sort of looked with the gun and i ultimately ended up under shooting that target so that's just another skill that I'm working on with this pistol, trying to get used to it. So far, I'm, again, well, I'll save my thoughts for the end, but this is a nice style drill that you can use to incorporate some steel with some cardboard.
get a little bit worn out by gun review channels because I think that they're boring, just being real with you. I try to do something different with TA targets because I don't really like to see myself or my team as YouTubers, and we are certainly not gun reviewers, even though I think in the future we will be doing more gun reviews, but I like to add a little bit more of a, hey, I actually shoot guns into the video rather than just sitting down at a table and talking about the gun. So if that's valuable to you, I'd love to hear some feedback from you guys. Um, I'm curious what you think about the format that we do here at TA Targets, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about the dagger and what I think about it. Well, I've got my Gen 4 Glock 19 in my hand here, and this is my tried and true, my trusty steed. This is what I carry with me every single day, and this is my favorite pistol I've ever shot, ever. Like, I've shot every pistol you could ever imagine from 2011s to decked out other Glock models, M&Ps, the 2.0s, everything. And I always come back to a Gen 4 Glock 19. Now, I know some of you probably think I have no taste at this point, but it just works. I was just telling the guys here on set that I've gone through two barrels on my Glock. I've replaced the spring multiple times. This is the second slide that I've put on this particular pistol. And it has just continued to be a workhorse that I've just kept updated over time, but I rarely ever have malfunctions with this pistol, even though I know I had one on the range here that I think was ammo related, but this has been a go-to pistol for me. So when we're talking about the dagger and this full-size suppressed model, I'm kind of weighing this conversation is where does this thing fall? Is this something that I would actually consider carrying and shooting over my Glock 19? And I'm going to be straightforward and honest with you guys. This pistol is, it's making me love it, which is weird for me to say. Now, one thing that I'm going to be very careful about here in this conversation, I'm not going to recommend this pistol to you. You're not going to find that in this video because this is my first range day with it. I put down probably 250, 300 rounds down range. That's just not enough ammo through this gun for me to say, hey, I endorse this pistol blindly. I just think you should own it. I think it's an interesting pistol. The recoil impulse feels really nice. The grip angle, surprisingly, I was really into. The only complaint that I had that I talked about a little bit was this little nub here, but it's gonna have a, a hot date with my Dremel tool and we're gonna remove that thing. Reloads were a little bit awkward. Again, hot date with my bandsaw and we're gonna chop that bad boy off on the bottom and just like that. Just, just what you saw there when I try to insert the mag, it gets caught. But overall, I'm extremely happy with this pistol. I think that what Palmetto is doing is offering a pistol at a price point that makes it worthwhile to stop and say, hey, is it worth it? If you shoot one and you like it, I think maybe it would be a good fit for you. Does it necessarily justify saving the 150, 200 bucks over a Glock? That's gonna be one that's very difficult for me to answer. I don't know if I can answer that for you. I'm not even going to try, to be honest. I think that it's an interesting pistol. I think it works. It obviously goes bang. It's very accurate from what I've seen. The cardboard behind me is a testament to that. Hundreds of rounds on the cardboard, and I have a couple Charlies, a couple Deltas, but nothing crazy, because I was, was pushing the speed for a while there. But aside from that, it appears to be a well-rounded pistol. Suppressed, we had some issues, and that's actually not surprising, and you're gonna see some of that in the B-roll. Whenever you throw a can on a gun like this, it is my experience that you always have to dial in the recoil spring. I've never had a pistol that I threw a can on, and it just ran flawlessly without doing some modifications. So it would have been nice if I could just slap the can on and send it. It's just not the case with this pistol. Maybe over time as I break it in, you might see that. But uh, other than a couple malfunctions, which I believe were ammo related, this gun did exactly what I wanted it to do on this range day. Last little caveat that I'm gonna talk about is fitting this thing into my sidecar holster is very snug. And I don't know if that's the holster or if it's just the fact that the gun's a little bit taller, maybe a little bit wider. There could be some stack tolerances here with this slide that just make it ever so slightly different than the Glock 19. It could simply be the distance between the barrel and the TLR7A as well. There's just things that, like I can't measure that, I can't tell what that is, but I can tell you that getting it in and out of the holster is a little bit of a chore. So I wouldn't be surprised if you see manufacturers building holsters that you would actually specify that you have a dagger and then what size dagger you have to fit into the holster properly. But all in all, it's a pistol that I'm actually starting to really enjoy. I didn't expect to enjoy it. I was bored about it right from the get-go, and I was like, oh, it's a Palmetto State Armory dagger. Cool, awesome, it's just a Glock. 
but the more that I shoot it, the more that I see that this might be a viable option for a lot of you. So that's my take on this particular pistol, and I hope that that was helpful. I ultimately just want to be helpful to you guys, and I hope that videos like this allow you to get information that maybe you wouldn't have had otherwise. It may be in a little bit different flavor than what you're used to seeing. So I appreciate you guys for tuning in. I always appreciate you guys for checking out our channel. And I do want to give you one last reminder for watching this show. If you want to grab some steel targets, cardboard targets, bases, or anything like apparel even on our website, like the Exodus shirt that I'm wearing here, you can save 15% by using the code DAGGER, D-A-G-G-E-R-1-5, at checkout. We'll put all the information and links down in the description. Just a small thank you for all of you that are tuning in. If you're in the market for some steel targets, I think that what we have is going to check every single box off for you in a way that no other steel target company is uh, going to do. And ultimately, you buying our products and supporting our team, it lets me pay Brenton and he likes to make a paycheck. So there's always that. <laughs> we appreciate you guys. Please like, subscribe, check out our other videos. We've got a host of content there on our YouTube channel. Check out that website, use the code. It's only going to be live for a couple weeks. Catch you in the next one.